I thought there's just no value in this. All I want to do is code and do math, which is what I majored in. And then when I got on Wall Street, I actually saw immediately in my first month there, the most powerful people at the firm were the ones who were writing these in-depth educational emails and sharing their ideas to other people, right? So they had this unique skill set. And I looked at some of the other investors that I really looked up to, Howard Marks, Warren Buffett. I mean, Jeff Bezos, you can kind of put in that camp, but they're all known for their clear writing to get their ideas out there. And so I saw this correlation and I said, wow, I, I've gone quite a long time thinking that this was a waste of time. How am I going to get better at it? Hey, hey, welcome to another episode of Marketing Against the Grain, your show for marketing-minded people everywhere. I'm Kip Bodner. I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Kieran Flanagan. And today, we have a very special guest. We are joined by the one and only Dickie Bush. If you've been on Twitter, you know who Dickie is. But first of all, Dickie is the captain of Ship 30 for 30. He's he's an amazing writer. Ship 30 for 30 has already helped 6,000 people basically begin their journey in writing and create their career, transform their lives with writing. And that's what we want to talk about today. Kieran, Dickie, and I have all had our lives completely transformed by one skill, writing. And it's a really important, really remarkable skill for anyone out there to master. And we want to talk about mastering writing today. Kieran, nice to be here with you. Where do you want to start us today? I'm actually still thinking about what you just said, Dickie, right before we came <laughs> Oh, online. yeah. Give the listeners a little preview. So you said you were you were on Wall Street until, did you say nine months ago? And that's when you started full-time writing? Yeah, nine months ago. So I graduated uh, from Princeton with a degree in math in 2018 and worked uh, at BlackRock for four years. The only job I've ever had. I interned there for two years. The only job interview I've actually ever had and uh, left there nine months ago. That's incredible because like, I feel like I've seen you on, on Twitter or seen your advice, maybe not much, much longer. And I know I've known ship 30 for 30 for, for a while, but if you just look at your Twitter following and look at the kind of audience you have on Twitter, that's a pretty fast pace. You've grown at a pretty fast pace. Like what are some of the ways that you managed to grow so quickly? Having only really started this like nine months, like why do you think you're, why do you think you were better than most other people? who actually do this? I should preface that I was writing at the same time. I was just okay. doing it in the morning and in the evening. So I started writing on Twitter. I made my Twitter account in July of 2020. So a little over two years ago and was doing that in the mornings and the evenings. What was nice about working on Wall Street is we were actually remote. And so uh, mm. we went remote in March 2020. And so when I got home, I realized how much of finance work was made up. And if you didn't have someone looking over your shoulder, checking what your Excel sheet was doing, there was a lot more free time than I thought. And that's oh, actually wow. how I uh, that's actually how I started to write. And my team, I who I'm still close with, not a single one of them was on Twitter. And so I was kind of raking up followers and writing there and having a good time. And, you know, like we were talking about with David Goggins only existing on YouTube before this, if you weren't on Twitter in our ecosystem, you'd have no clue that what I was doing. So it was a nice way of just having a creative outlet, building on that and while still continuing to work full time. Uh, I, okay. I got one, I got one follow up on that before before you go, Kieran, which is I have a lot of friends. I work with a lot of people who were in a situation like you were in that I would call them spreadsheet lovers. They lived in spreadsheets. They did a lot of analysis. And anytime it comes to talking to them about writing, they like they get white. <laughs> you know, they get terrified of the idea of writing. And you're one of those rare people who you, you spend a lot of time in spreadsheets, but now you're doing basically the exact opposite. You are doing creative writing. And so how did that happen? And like, what's your advice for somebody who wants to get out of the spreadsheet life? How it happened goes back all the way to my freshman year of college. So we were required to take a writing seminar and I hated it. I hated the teacher. <laughs> I hated the way they taught it. I hated <laughs> that I was being told what to write. I hated that they were like analyzing these words that I didn't think mattered. I hated that if they assigned a 5,000 word paper and you wrote 10,000 words, you got bonus points. I, none of that ever made sense to me. <laughs> that was the only class I took that required writing. Right after that, I didn't take another philosophy or a history or anything like that because I was just, I thought there's just no value in this. All I want to do is code and do math, which is what I majored in. And then when I got 
on Wall Street, I actually saw immediately in my first month there, the most powerful people at the firm were the ones who were writing these in-depth educational emails and sharing their ideas to other people, right? So they had this unique skill set. And I looked at some of the other investors that I really looked up to, Howard Marks, Warren Buffett, I mean, Jeff Bezos, you can kind of put in that camp, but they're all known for their clear writing to get their ideas out there. And so I saw this correlation and I said, wow, I, I've gone quite a long time thinking that this was a waste of time. How am I going to get better at it? And so I just started. I, I started a newsletter in January 2020 for no other reason than it's going to force me if I do this every week for a year to get better at this. Worst case, no one reads it for a full year, but I get more skilled at it. Best case, which is exactly what happened, I kind of unlock the the exponential upside of the internet. So back to your, your question on how do you get started on it, it's realizing that how powerful it is to get started. And I think just getting over that initial fear of like, oh, what am I going to say? What am I going to write about? It doesn't really matter if you extend the time horizon and say, I'm going to write for the next 10 years. Just start to put something out that you have a unique expertise in. And if you're a spreadsheet junkie, chances are you're doing something that you have a strong expertise in and you can start to kind of scale that thinking uh, if you start to put your ideas out there. I love that. And, and, and there are two things in that that I think are really important that most people watching, I don't think, understand. The first thing is that writing is just as much for you as it is other people. Every time you write something, you are like catalyzing your thoughts and basically teaching yourself a lot of stuff you already knew, but you're reprocessing it and making it all clear and actually making it make sense to yourself, not just other people. And the value of that to like how you're able to communicate, how you're able to build knowledge is is really exponential. The second thing you talked about that I think is really important that I want to underline for everybody is the commitment of having to do it on a regular basis. Just like anything else, I talked about the intro, like writing changing all of our lives. The way writing changed my life is I was... I don't know, probably your age, Dickie, uh, at the time. And I decided that the internet was going to change the world and I was going to write a blog. And what I was going to do is I was going to write a blog article every day. And I would wake up before I go to work. I'd have give myself an hour to write, edit, and publish a blog post every day. And holy shit, that was the most transforming thing I have done in my entire life. That led me to meet Brian and Dermesh at HubSpot, led me to the career I have, led me to make more money than I ever thought I would have. Like, it is crazy that just organizing your thoughts and doing so in a disciplined way on a regular basis, I cannot express to anybody listening, watching, that if you just did that one thing, it is life-changing. That is the, the basis of Ship 30, was recognizing that when I went from publishing a weekly blog post to a daily short post every single morning, an atomic essay on Twitter, and it's so cool to hear that that has impacted you the same way it impacted me because it's worth digging on that for a second of why that's so impactful. You have yeah. a consistent kind of keystone habit that I don't know if, about you, but when I am always writing every morning, every single thing falls into place afterwards. I have that yes. keystone morning habit where, you know, it's much easier to exercise that day. It's much easier to because you start to build around it. You're more creative throughout the day because you're thinking I have to write and publish something tomorrow. I better be trying to find ideas right now. The number of data points and opportunities that you're putting out into the world for people to find you. I mean, every single person that I talk to on a weekly basis consistently right now outside of my parents, I met via the internet from my writing, right? So it just becomes this way to attract people. So, I mean, we're kind of preaching to the choir here on the power of doing it every single day, but I think you, you hit it spot on of doing that every single day for a month or two months will complete for a long time, completely change your life trajectory. Even if you are terrible at it, if you just do it for a while and you do it regularly and you are reflective about it, you think about what you can do better or what people liked, what people didn't like, and you do it in public. You can't do it in private. You need to do it in public. You need to do it every day and you need to do it in public. Kieran, what do you think? I think there's one aspect of that where right in is part of it's part of everything you do within life like it's just a communication tool, tool whether you're only using that for internal comms external comms or notoriety it's just such an important skill set to have where i wanted to go was kind of shift that i have seen over the last couple of years is that writing is arguably now one of the most valuable skills you can have 
And I'm trying to think, is that a good thing or a bad thing? And what I mean by that is... It's a great thing. We asked, uh, we had Christopher Lockhead on the show, the author of Play Bigger, a week or so ago. We asked him the same question, which is, everyone seems very motivated to build a personal brand today. Everyone seems very motivated to own their own audience, to have notoriety. The place where I think it's coming at the most is like you have these very successful finders. Like there was a conversation on Twitter. I won't actually say the name between two people. And one of them was a really successful finder. And that successful finder was like very openly saying, oh, now I, I want to try to really nail this Twitter thread game. And, and how do I build a big audience here on Twitter? And someone was saying to them, like, why are you doing that? Like you were one of the people who were just building a business, doing the thing and didn't care about audience. And so like it feels like even entrepreneurs who have already made it, won the game, care about notoriety. And so I guess my question is, have you seen a shift in terms of like the interest and the importance people are putting on Raiden and using Raiden to build their own audience? And do you see this kind of pervasive thing within tech of like everyone is trying to scramble for notoriety? Like there's never been so much value placed on the art of building your own audience. I think it comes back to almost a level higher of people want to be able to capture attention. Mm. And right now, if you don't have attention, you lack some resource in some way, right? Your ability to do things when you have a consistent drip of attention coming towards you in any given field is is just like raw material to, to do things or build things or launch things. And so I think maybe these founders who have built a successful company and maybe sold it or something like that, then look around of like how much easier it would be for them to dig into the next thing if they had this stream of attention of people giving them ideas receptive to their ideas, right? Where it's now instead of potentially starting at zero, you're starting at this new higher foundation, right? Where you can launch it to that group or they're interested in what you're doing. So I think there's a little bit of a string to pull on there of it is a, it just makes the startup cost in terms of a new idea so much lower and you can test more ideas faster when you have, an audience or a brand or a stream of attention that you can kind of direct things towards. Yeah, I, I think the question is like, is it better to have influence versus reach? And you can have one without the other because you can be influential to a very small number of people mm. and never need the reach to be successful. And there's been this huge up leveling, I think, in terms of people's writing. Like, I think there's way better writers today Post COVID, I do think COVID was an accelerant of this. Mm -hmm. Like people's skills got so much better mm -hmm. because they had so much more time to focus on it. But I do think like there's a real over indexing on reach. Right? There was another mm -hmm. founder, I use an example, who is building an audience on Twitter that is not related to the brand or company he's building, but it just feels like, oh, well, I've found an, I found an angle, I found a place where I can like grow, do these Twitter threads and grow an audience. And I do wonder like, is it good that we all want attention, awareness, and notoriety? And, you know, I think why writing has become the most valuable skill on the internet is because of that shift towards, you know, those things and people wanting those things. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you the way I think about this and the way we kind of talk about it in Ship 30 is that all content lives on a spectrum of reach and resonance. So mm. on the far, far right, you have resonance and on the far, far left, you have reach. So I'll give you a couple examples that will drive that home. And the, the working framework to think about this is the size of the question dictates the size of the audience. So if you're writing something as general topic as you possibly could, right? Like, how do I be happier? How do I make more money? How do I be more productive? The total addressable market is everyone. But if you're writing how to manage your time as a, you know, executive CMO and you write, there's very, very few people that will be able to read that. But the resonance that that person will have with your writing is so much higher. So I'll, I'll right. show an example of thinking about this. You've probably seen a lot of these Twitter threads where they say, you know, 10 Chrome extensions that changed my life or will change your life. And those right. have 50,000, 100,000 likes, right? right? That is maximal reach, right? What is the addressable market? It's every person that uses Google Chrome. That's a lot, like a lot of people. But what that means is when they write that, there is no relationship built between the writer and the reader meaning yes. you are basically a commodity you might as well be an anonymous face or one of these like motivation faceless youtube channels right right you are not building an audience by any means you are providing a commodity service that anyone could provide 
And where I think people go wrong is they do that and they get success and they see success on that. It's like, wow, this went viral. Now I need to write it on all these other broad topics. And they do that for a couple months and then realize that if they were to share something about their personal life, no one would care. And that is not the place to be as you're building. You want to strike. I mean, yes, you can write things that have a lot of reach and those are good. But make sure it's attracting the type of people that are also going to resonate with your unique experience. And you need to figure out those things to write about. So as a founder, you don't want to only be writing Google Chrome extension hacks, right? You want to be writing, hey, here's how we face this exact problem of going from 3 to 10 million MRR. And here's how we solved it, right? Where it's going to have a far, far smaller audience by definition. But the people that read it, it's going to be so valuable to that you now have a new lifelong reader where it doesn't matter what you put out. It's going to be relevant to them because of that one piece you wrote that was like, I don't know how you knew I had this problem, but thank you for talking about it because now I want to read everything you write. The interesting part about this, right? It's not a new problem. If you think about Thomas Paine, Alexander Hamilton, all of these people, their default was like, I am going to maximize my resonance, my life and my reputation in the world is going to be about what I tell people in this printed book. And I will hand them out. I will try to get them out to the world. But like these thoughts will last forever. And they did, which is which is a very good and important thing. And I think it backs up what Dickie is saying here. And then, you know, as modern publishing and everything changed, we we fixed the distribution and and evened it out a lot. But then what happened, the Internet came along. And if you realize to me, only in the last five-ish years, have we gotten better at monetizing high resonance content? There, the early stage of the internet was very much about the monetization of the mass market, high reach content, CPM models, all of those things. Now with Substack, now with YouTube creators, all of those things, you can have deep, deep resonance and real reach, mm. and you can have the best of both. But it wasn't always the case on the internet. And I think wasn't always the case with writing, especially the last several decades. And what I think we are living in is a new golden age of writing where you can have real resonance and make a living off that, which is pretty remarkable. So I think you can make money off sugar or substance or Mm -hmm. a mix of both, right? You can be the person that gives everyone sugar where it's like, it is those, hey, don't do an MBA. These 10 YouTube channels are worth $10 billion in like free education, right? And, you know, that's a lot of sugar, right? Because that's people yeah. like, I'm ne- that's a lot of people clicking through the Twitter thread, are never going to do any of the videos, are never <laughs> going to put any of that in their action, but they're just like, sugar, 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 sugar. I need sugar, 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 right? If you actually go sugar, you can actually monetize that if you have a large enough audience. And then you have substance. And I think substance is the thing that has actually become much more prevalent today, which I do think is a good thing, where if you give a lot of substance, you give a lot of like deep intellect, you can actually make a lot of money by having a thousand people read that stuff and buy your stuff. You actually don't need to do all those things. Now, I think there's a blend of both as well but i do think that there is a lot of gravitation towards sugar i think people really care about the size of the audience and i think that is i think that's good because people are trying to really improve their writing but i do think people misconstrue those things i think dickie you actually described it really good which is if you're doing the chrome plugins sure you're going to get a big audience but are you ever really going to be able to monetize that it's also like not really hard to create that kind of content everyone can kind of do the 10 aggregated Chrome plugins, but it's a good way to start as a writer, like move from curation up to creation. I think that's actually, I don't know if you actually, do you give any advice for people in terms of they could start at curation and they can move up to creation or like there's these different ladders they can go up? That was the exact path I followed was I talk a lot about writing and have started to create my own frameworks and things like that. But I built a lot of my audience saying, hey, guys, I'm not an expert on this, but I'm going to go research the writing routines of Gary Halbert and David Ogilvy and Tim Ferriss and James Clear and distill those. And I built up a re- reputation of doing a good job researching and distilling things and had a twofold thing. I was learning quickly because I was writing about it, right? Mm. So you can look at curation as a way to learn a skill and then teach it to the people behind you. You're going to learn it faster. You're going to attract an audience along the way. And then as you continue to grow, you're going to find a new thing to learn, distill that for the people behind you. And so, yes, that is, if you don't know where to start, start with collecting resources and say, what do I want to learn? What do I want to learn over the next two years? Why don't I just write about that? 
and figure out, okay, what YouTube channels am I going to watch? What books am I going to read? All those kind of things. Do that research, distill it, and then that's how you get your initial flywheel spinning because now you have people coming to you for attention. You don't want to go so far in that rabbit hole where you're not learning anything because back to the Google Chrome plugins, you're not learning anything there, right? right. You're just collecting things, you know? But if it's, hey, I'm, I want to learn how to code and I'm going to find the best coding books and then I'm going to find the best coding podcasts and I'm going to learn and share those with other people, that's a, that's a nice way to go about it. There's two personas that I see work really well, and I'll give an example of one that I think is doing a really great job, which is the curious learner and the deep thinker, right? And I think what you're describing as the curious learner, that you're actually adding value because you are trying to learn these things. You are providing commentary, you're providing information on the things that you're learning, but you're still curating, but you're a curious learner. And then you have the deep thinker that has just like Balaji, right? It, like deep thinker, mm -hmm. deep thoughts on like how to build a network state. And a really good example of someone who's done a good job iterating to find their angle and curious learner is Alex from Lemon.io. Like I saw him like trying to iterate on Twitter threads and now he's found a really good niche, which is companies that are worth a lot of money that have no employees, right? I see him continually like building out these kind mm. of threads. Now that's dual curation because he's curating their stories, but he's actually curated them in a very like curious learner. Like I really want to understand how these businesses work. And I think there's a lot of value in those two ways of of creating content. I think the important thing to remember is people confuse writing as a teaching tool when it's actually a learning tool, right? Mm. Like you, if you want to learn, write. <laughs> the unintended consequences of that is other people will learn with you, but you are not teaching through writing. You are actually, you know, learning yourself through writing. And it's funny you say this because the pithy one line tweet to that is, I used to write once I figured it out. Now I write to figure it out. Yes. And that goes back to most of the things I say out loud now when, I, when I'm when i talking with other people, I've actually written down before. And because I've written it down, I have thought through it and I've mm. thought clearly about it, right? And so I, I sometimes find myself drawing from tweets I've written or things I've read or writ and then written about when I'm having a conversation because that just means I've thought through it. And so writing is a learning tool. You're spot on where most people think I have to be some kind of expert to talk about this thing. And the framework we use to talk about this is picture yourself as a third grader, right? When you were in third grade, the eighth graders were not that interesting to you, right? They lived a completely different world. They didn't have, they were at a different school. They had different teachers, different classrooms. Like you, you, you were wanted nothing to do with anything they had to say. The coolest people on earth were the fourth graders, right? Because they were just one step ahead of you. And it was they got an extra 10 minutes of recess or they had this new teacher or they, you know, started this new topic. And on the Internet, we are all third graders where we have fourth graders we can learn from and second graders we can teach, which means you don't have to be any kind of master. You just need to share, hey, here's what I'm doing now at this step in my journey. And you have people to learn from and people to to help educate as well. So that's how I think about writing at any time. I'm trying to learn from the people in front of me and teach the second graders behind me. And then I just kind of, I'm going through school. I'm leveling up, I'm learning more. And as I go, I know that there's even more people to teach and even more people to learn from. You know, when you started, you were kind of that curious learner. You were reading all of these frameworks, models, books. What was the most important one? Like what was the one that you think really had real impact on your trajectory and your success? Ooh, so on the writing side, I think... I can't point to a single one. I think it was more recognizing that if I wanted to learn to write, I just wanted to study the people who are doing it well. So I yes. found what was James Clear doing? How does he talk about writing? How does he talk about his writing routine? What does Tim Ferriss do? What do some of these legendary copywriters do? And as I did that, I the number one thing I recognized was these guys weren't some kind of masterful writer where they sat down and stared at a blank page and then th things just effortlessly flowed from them. It was the way they lived their life turned their writing into a byproduct, not a result. So they had a routine where they knew they show up, showed up at the same time every single day, right? They had these creative resources. They had warm-up routines. They had different people to talk to. They had ways to block distractions, right? All of these different parts of their life that made writing inevitable. Right? It was more difficult not to write than to just sit down and get those ideas out because of the way they did everything else. So that was a big realization for me. I think when you have this idea of, wow, that, that writer, they just they sit down. It's like the SpongeBob episode where he just stares at the blank page and then has this masterpiece written by the end. 
And that just wasn't the case. These guys just had a, a diligent routine that they stuck to for, for years and the results took care of themselves. Did you do copy work? Like, you know, the mm. copyright, like, you know, copy different parts of content and instill that into your brain. Like I, I've tried that and I just have not found that. I used to try it a lot and I did not, not find it resonated really well. Like I turn, cause my brain gets turned off. Like just for our listeners, copy work is basically take people's content who you admire and literally like write it out word for word. So I have a folder that has comedic write-in. I have a folder that has actually uh, this really good site where you can go and read memos from famous business leaders, like internal memos. So like Bezos memos, all these kind of memos. And I would write those out for like memo write-in within HubSpot. But the problem I always had was like my brain would kind of shut off. So you're kind of just like tracing over their words, but interested like, any kind of routines like that that really really work for you, like copy work, or it sounds like maybe you have scheduled time each and every morning that you write. Like, what what are some of the daily habits or daily rituals that have really worked for you? So I'll dig into a couple of those. The copy work I've had mixed success with in the very very beginning, where I didn't even know what it looked like to write something well, it was helpful because I would, you know, I said I literally never read like a long form sales letter or a high quality business memo. What? Is, okay, let's see what that kind of feels like. But I don't do that anymore. So I'm kind of in your camp there of like it worked, but it's not something I rely on heavily. In terms of routines, I can point to two. It's one, I capture ideas everywhere. So I have these post-it notes by my bed sitting right here. I kept a notebook with me. I have quick capture on my phone. I'm always just like on the search for an idea and figuring out how to get it out of my head as quickly as possible. Mm. Then. I have a daily time of day. It's not an exact set time, but it's some 90 minute block every single morning after either breakfast or after I work out or something like that. It kind of varies, but I know I write for 90 minutes at least every single day where that gives my mind the freedom to say, I can come up with ideas because I know I have a set time of day to go through and process them. I know I'm going to be thinking and I'd say on two thirds, maybe three quarters of the days, it's way longer than 90 minutes, but I just know I have that single block all the time and it just compounds, right? Because I'm coming up with ideas, I think through them. Ideas, think through them, build on them. And those two have been very helpful. I want to follow up on with, with kind of an inverse question. It's a question I ask anybody who makes things. And, hmm. you know, you're sitting, you know, at least 90 minutes a day, you're writing, you're working on something, you have an idea. The, the question I have is, how do you know when it's done? You know, like, you can spin forever, you can underdo it, you can overdo it. it the hardest mm -hmm. thing about making something is determining when it's done. Yeah, the, the quote of books are never finished, they're merely abandoned, I think is perfect, <laughs> exactly. right? Where the, the, the author just can no longer stand to look at them. To me, it, it goes back to having some kind of output cadence. And I say, if I'm going to publish something every single day or every single week, create those constraints that don't allow you to overthink or over edit or fall victim to a perfectionism. So it's, hey, if look, I think eventually in my career, I won't be on a consistent cadence. I'll be on that Paul Graham style. When I have something valuable to say, I'll say it. But for now, I love the constraint of, because where most people I think go wrong is they are like, this doesn't feel perfect, but perfect to who? What matters is what the audience has to say about it. So it's almost better to start putting things out there way earlier and we think about this as lean writing, like just like the lean startup of having a startup, getting an MVP out there. We think with writing, it's what's the minimum viable way that I can say I'm interested in this idea and writing about it. But instead of spending 100 hours crafting the perfect blog post and like getting 100 editors, how can I write bullet points in a tweet format, put that out there and then see what people are interested from that and then build on it where never before in the history of writing, have we had these rapid fire feedback loops? Like you talked about Alexander Hamilton and and those guys. I mean, think about what it took to put something in a book back then mm -hmm. and have it printed <laughs> and all of that. Whereas now so it's, hard. I have an idea, right? I have an idea, it's on Twitter. I have a ton of people, that's interesting, that's not interesting. Could you talk more about this? Yes, then you go and write more about it. So right. that's how I, I think about this. Avoiding the perfectionism trap is realizing you don't know what you're optimizing for. And until you start to really hear what the audience is interested in reading, you shouldn't spend hours editing anything. Mm, that, that I think that's a huge part of life in general, which is 
just ship it like it's you you can really just over try to think and perfect the thing that you're doing especially in writing like i think on writing and the internet you know, the grammar and all like you like the the fancy words and all of that are kind of when you're writing twitter threads like does that really matter or just the idea no, really of matter it doesn't and one thing i think a lot about for ideas i think the ideation is really important right today like how, how do you find interesting ideas that have not that they've not been done before like everything has been done before but like the angle or the or to perspective or the point of view and i do wonder like how both of you think about this is are you a better writer when you have you're inspired somewhere so you're either inspired in your work you're inspired in there's things going on in your life that are inspirational to you there's conversations you have that are inspiring thoughts or are you kind of just self-reliant like it doesn't really matter the work you're doing, the life you're lead leading, the conversations you're having, you can actually still have like a really good pipeline of ideas. I think about that a lot myself. Like, do I have better ideas when there's like, I'm inspired in some part of my life and like that's causing my brain to really spark? Or is it just more about habit? It's like going to the gym. Like I'm just, every day I get into the routine of like thinking up really great ideas, really great angles, really great point of views. I'll give you my take on it. My take on it here is it could be both for me. This is for my brain, my, the best things I've ever written felt like I couldn't type fast enough. You yeah. know, like I had an idea that had to yeah. come out and that don't, couldn't type fast. It doesn't mean like I just typed it all up and it was done. Right. Like that, that doesn't. But it's just like I have all of these ideas that I have to get them out so that I can then organize them and then reorganize them and make them clear and then get them to the world. Right. And it's like that pace and urgency around it of like. I know I have something that is valuable and interesting, not just to me, but to other people. And it's a different perspective that needs to be heard. And most people in life spend their time working on stuff that doesn't matter. And that's the problem, right? And once you have something that matters, then it's just, then it's just a race to get it out and make it good. But what, and, sparked, that, what sparked that feeling? That's what I'm getting at is like, is yeah. that from a conversation? Is that from something you read? Like- or is it just well, like, hey, I'm sitting there and I just I have this idea? Well, I resonate a lot with what Dicky has talked about, which is you have to give your your mind time and space, right? Yes, for me, it almost always comes when your mind has time and space. So, right, walking, showering, things where you're like, oh, I have to do something, but that something does not require thought. Really, it's kind of like. You know, I'm I'm walking, I'm I'm washing my hair, what have you. Then your mind kind of wanders, and as it wanders, you just get prompted by something in your head, right? You're just like, oh yeah, I remember Kieran said said this thing to me. Oh yeah, that was interesting. Oh, now that I think about it, it's actually really interesting. And you start going down that yeah, rabbit hole. Same, same and then as me. by the time you're like drying off out of the shower, you're like. I don't know what I was supposed to be doing, but I can't do that thing anymore. I got to go and sit down and do the thing I really have to do, which is to get this out. But you, not everybody can be that like impulsive, right? And so I think that comes back to what you're talking about, having like kind of the fixed time to go and do it, right? Our society does not value thinking time. And I used to no. even tell my people on my team is like, hey, you should put in like, try to put in like half an hour, an hour in your calendar to think. <laughs> and they're like, to think? Like, like just, <laughs> yeah. Think about problems like creative solutions and it's kind of like like and nowhere in the calendar is like their thinking time people Dickie, don't know how to think people don't know how to think mm -hmm. because people are thinking about problems and solutions versus principles they're doing right? active like you, thinking yeah you need the principles to say like what matters like what mm -hmm. is actually worth spending this mental energy on and, and like for example like if you have a business problem you're saying like you have to do the rough math like i was watching a youtube video with david goggins and for people who don't know he's like this crazy ultra athlete he holds the world record for the most pull-ups ever right he's done over four i think it was like over five thousand pull-ups and most people look at that and be like oh i could never do five and he's one like go? i just yeah one and day. he did the whole think, right? he did the whole yeah. math of like how much you in a day or whatever, whatever the constraint was. But he basically just did the back of the napkin math of like, how do I get there? And then he started thinking about it and training and f building a training plan and doing all of this. And like, that's what thinking time is for. I don't know, Dickie, do you, like, is that how you work? Like, how do you use your time to think? I think you put it perfectly of having these creative outlets of thinking time. So for me, I'm 15 to 20,000 steps a day because all of my best thinking happens on walks. 
So walks mm. in the morning, long runs without my phone. I love walking so much, but I hated not being able to capture ideas. So I have like an old iPod touch style iPhone. I don't know what like year it is, but all it has on it is a note take like notes and maps. So I can go <laughs> for a walk idea. and I can capture ideas. And it then goes back to, I have this free time to capture ideas. So time without my phone, time with just a journal, time with just a notebook, time in nature. But I have that set time of day where I know I'm going to process those ideas so that when I am inspired, not every time I sit down to write during those 92 hour minute blocks do the ideas flow. But I know that if it's like, I just went for a long walk and I'm outlining this idea. The next time I sit down, I'm going to have one of the best writing sessions ever. And so that to me is that barbell of having unstructured time to capture these ideas, but a structured time to then process them and mm-hmm. get through them. Because then it's all I'm really worrying about is making sure that on that unstructured time, I'm exploring, I'm thinking, I'm brainstorming. And then It's easy when I sit down because I have this long list of notes. It's like, let's just get this out. That's awesome. So what are the most common mistakes that people make? Like most of writing is actually pretty terrible. Like if you, (laughs) particularly if you go on LinkedIn, I I actually do like LinkedIn. I think it's actually a good content platform and actually may become much better because I think people are trying to hedge their bet on on what's going to happen to Twitter. And also the discourse on LinkedIn is a little bit more civil and like, (sighs) more yes. structured around just yeah. business, which I really do enjoy. You don't, and because you're like a real person, you're not going to bring in all this kind of bullshit on, onto it. Right. So like the actual comments are somewhat valuable, but most of the, most of the write-in is terrible. Right. Like, and that's fine. Like everyone's trying to get better, but what are the most common mistakes Dickie you see like people make? If you had a class, your ship 30 for 30 of like a hundred people, what is the couple of mistakes that most of them are actually going to make? So I'll, I'll talk on mistakes. Just one point on LinkedIn. I think you're hundred percent right. I saw, I can't remember who, I think it was Amanda Natividad um, said LinkedIn is like corporate TikTok, where there's a massive mismatch between supply and demand. So if you think about yes. it, most people are being watched by their boss on LinkedIn or are followed by their boss. So they're not going to write anything, <laughs> but they're going to comment on things that make it look like they're engaging in good discourse and they're mm. going to be very nice in the comments. So yes, I've started to write on LinkedIn and the 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 network, the people there, they're so much nicer. They really engage well. And the algorithm, the LinkedIn algorithm, anytime it sees high quality writing, I just picture like the, the robots stopping <laughs> everything saying like, guys, <laughs> someone just put and no one can stop reading this. How do we show this to everyone? So they think that this is what LinkedIn's all about. So I think it's a massive arbitrage if you are a high quality writer to be creating on LinkedIn because of that. But in terms of mistakes, I'd say the number one is writing from a place of ego where Mm. you sit down to write and it's, Mm. I spent so much time on this that the second I hit publish, everyone's going to read it, right? I, this is for me. I'm writing for me, all this. And instead we say you have to think empathetically as a writer where you need to put yourself in the reader's shoes and say, how is this valuable to them? And once you make that subtle flip of like this, instead of this took me 10 hours to write, I can't wait to hit publish. And everyone's going to say, wow, I bet you work so hard on this. It's how am I solving a problem for someone? And how am I going to get that solution in front of them? So we teach from the very first day is you cannot approach this with me, 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 you have to think reader first, reader first. What problem is this solving? Whose problem is it solving? What benefits am I unlocking? And put yourself in their shoes. That that by far, once you make that switch, writing takes care of itself because you know, it's easy when you're solving a problem that you know exists and you go find that and you solve it. I think that is 100% the most, like you just write from the thing that you will enjoy and, and the thing that you think should get a ton of attention versus the thing your audience actually wants. And it's, it's worth realizing where that comes from is I think in school, we, we realized that, or we were taught that if I write something, the teacher's going to read it, they're forced to read yes. it. And so they have to go through, but in the yeah, real yeah. world, it's, if you put something out, that's not valuable, it's just, no one's going to read it. And then people no. go, oh, the algorithm's not working or the reader, <laughs> they're just not getting it. Right. Like, wait, I have this genius, but no one can see it. Like I'm the starving writer versus the writer that goes, hey, I, I'm not quite sure what it is you guys want, but I'm going to figure out what it is you want and I'm going to serve it to you and then I'm going to compound that way. Same thing right. like building a startup, right? If you're building a startup, 
solving a problem that no one has, it's not going to go anywhere. But people make that disconnect with writing like it's anything different, but I think they're very similar. It's, yep. it's, the, cl- it's the classic, like, if you aren't achieving what you want, it's because it's not good enough. Like, what you, what you yourself is doing is not good <laughs> enough. There's not, like, some mystery out there to blame. There's not some conspiracy against you. It's just like, you haven't learned enough and aren't, aren't doing it well enough yet. Okay, this this has been awesome. I love the conversation that we have had on writing, personally, because I'm a writing dork and I love writing. And so anytime we get to talk about a, a topic you love is, is wonderful. But I think if, if you're watching out there, what you want to take away from this conversation is that in an era where we're on YouTube and everybody's on TikTok, like writing is still... I think the most durable and important skill that exists because you can take great, you know how they, you make a great movie? You write a freaking script, right? Like you can't do anything without great writing. It's foundational to all of this. And Dickie, I love the work that you, you all are doing at Ship 30 for 30. I love the work that you've just done personally yourself to get out of the world of like engineering math and into the world of writing is a real inspiration to everybody. And I want to thank you for taking time with us today. And we'll see everybody real soon on Marketing Against the Green. Hey, thanks for having me. Have a good one, guys. This data is wrong every freaking time. Have you heard of HubSpot? HubSpot is a CRM platform where everything is fully integrated. Whoa, I can see the client's whole history. Calls, support tickets, emails, and here's a task from three days ago I totally missed. HubSpot, grow better. 